Hello, ladies and gentlemen. In August of last year, I created a Talking Head documentary all about the Sega Dreamcast. I invited a number of creators to come and share their own thoughts and memories on the platform and how they view the system to be perceived today. Whilst this video drew on many people's experiences, today's video will differ in the fact that it will draw on how I experienced the Dreamcast and most importantly, whether or not playing it in 2018 is worth it. So sit back, relax and let me take you through the journey of Sega's last home console endeavour. Yeah! To put the Dreamcast into context, we first have to look to the Sega Saturn, which in turn leads us to looking at the Sega 32X. In the same year, the world saw the release of two Sega 32-bit game platforms. The Sega Saturn, as we know, was a fifth generation games console with games that come on a CD-ROM format. The system had a dual CPU architecture with eight processors. The system went head to head with the Sony PlayStation and in its later days, the Nintendo 64. Whilst not that popular in the West, in Japan, on the other hand, the Sega Saturn sold reasonably well and even outsold the Nintendo 64. As stated previously, it was a different story elsewhere though, and some blame the Sega Saturn sales performance directly on its Sega 32-bit counterpart, the Sega 32X. The Sega 32X was an add-on device designed to expand the power of the Genesis and serve as a traditional console. The Sega 32X add-on was created as a result of a panic from Sega of America, as a result of the Atari Jaguar being released. Sega of America were aware of the Sega Saturn's development, however they chose to rush out a cartridge-based Genesis add-on regardless. Globally, the Sega 32X was a commercial failure. You could argue that by Sega releasing two different systems simultaneously, that it would have created some confusion and apathy amongst consumers towards the company. By 1997, Sega of America received a new vice president in the form of Bernie Stola. Stoller was not supportive of the Saturn due to his belief that the hardware was poorly designed and publicly announced at E3 1997 that the Saturn is not our future. While Stoller had no interest in lying to the people about the Saturn's prospects, he continued to emphasise quality games for the system and subsequently reflected that we tried to wind it down as cleanly as we could for the consumer. Of course, all of this leads us to the Sega Dreamcast, the all or nothing 128-bit console, which at the time was by far the most powerful games console that has ever been conceived. So now, taking you away from a bit of gaming history and over to my personal history during this time period, my main games consoles of choice were the Nintendo 64 and Sony PlayStation. Previous to this, I owned a Super Nintendo. However, I had played a lot of Sega Mega Drive and Sega Master System games around friends' houses. I was always happy with my Super Nintendo, so upgrading from that to the Nintendo 64 was an easy decision for me. However, upon receiving the Nintendo 64, I noticed I quickly became bored due to a pathetically slow game release schedule. Whilst I adored the games, I had needed something more, and that leaded to my purchase of the Sony PlayStation, so that I actually had some choice when it came to the release of new games. Whilst all this was going on, I was hearing the Dreamcast rumblings, but I felt like I had enough gaming content not to bother with the upcoming system. I had never needed a Sega console before, so why should things change now? Whilst this was my initial thoughts, my next door neighbour thought differently. He managed to secure a job in the local corner shop, and from his £2.50 an hour 15 year old earnings, he managed to secure a Sega Dreamcast on launch. Yeah! But we will get to back to this story later. The home video game console known as the Dreamcast saw releases by Sega on November 27, 1998 in Japan, September 9, 1999 in North America and October 14, 1999 in Europe. It was the first in what was considered the sixth generation of video game consoles, which sits alongside the original Xbox, the Nintendo GameCube and Sony PlayStation 2. The Dreamcast, however, came a couple of years before any of these hit the market, so the system, power-wise, blew its Nintendo 64 and Sony PlayStation competition away for a good while. It is of note that Sega held a competition to name this system, 
ultimately choosing the name Sega Dreamcast, which served as a portmanteau of both Dream and Broadcast. At one point in time, Sega even considered removing the Sega name from the product altogether, due to the feeling that the brand had been tarnished by the Sega Saturn 32X kerfuffle. However, ultimately, this move was never executed. Sega tried to avoid some of the previous mistakes they had made in the console arena, taking into account that the Sega Saturn had been set back by its high production costs and complex hardware. Due to this, Sega this time took a different approach. The Dreamcast was designed around intelligent subsystems working in parallel with one another, but a selection of this hardware was more in line with what was common in personal computers, rather than what you would normally get with video game consoles, reducing the overall cost. The system also included a built-in modem, allowing for web browsing and online play, which we will go into in more detail shortly. In terms of media, the system used a GD-ROM media format, which was developed as a joint endeavour between Sony and Yamaha. These could be mass-produced at a cheap, effective cost, while simultaneously being able to avoid the expensive DVD-ROM technology. GD-ROMs could hold one gigabyte of data. Further to this, Microsoft lent a helping hand too, by developing a custom Dreamcast version of Windows CE, making it easier to port PC games over to the platform. However, ultimately, most developers chose to rely on Sega tools instead. The Dreamcast controller itself was also very unique at the time. In fact, it is still unique to this day, due to the fact that you could insert VMU memory cards into them. The Visual Memory Unit, also referred to as the Visual Memory System, functioned primarily as memory cards, but featured monochrome liquid crystal displays. In the loosest of senses, this offered multiplayer gaming capabilities via connectors at the top, second screen functionality, a real-time clock, a file manager, built-in flash memory and sound capability. Whilst this may all sound exciting, to be honest, I do not really recall using any of these features. However, the VMU was a nice little gimmick that really made the Dreamcast stand out and look even more futuristic at the time. Most of us around the world had these standard VMUs, however Japan on the other hand saw the release of a few branded ones, with themes such as Sonic, Capcom and Hello Kitty. Prior to launch, the Dreamcast attracted significant interest and drew many pre-orders. This was also in part due to Sega announcing that Sonic Adventure would be arriving at the system's launch. Mainline Sonic games were questionably absent from both the Sega Saturn and the 32X, so the return of Sonic just added further fire to the Dreamcast hype train. In Japan, the Dreamcast completely sold out on day one of the system's release. However, Sega's inability to reach market demand may have hindered them long term that day. Speaking of the early days of the Dreamcast in Japan, the country's first major hit on the system was Seaman, because, um, well, you know, Japan. Elsewhere, Bernie Stoller and Sega America worked hard to ensure a more successful US launch, with a minimum of 15 launch games. Despite continual bitterness over the Sega Saturn, Stoller managed to repair relations with a lot of major US retailers, leading to 300,000 pre-sales of the system prior to the platform's launch. Despite all of this though, Stoller ended up being fired prior to the system's launch, leaving Peter Moore in charge. Sega went on to set a new sales record by selling more than 225,132 Dreamcast units in 24 hours, earning the company $98.4 million in what Moore called the biggest 24 hours in entertainment retail history. Over the first two weeks, Dreamcast sales in the US exceeded 500,000 units by Sega and clawed Sega's console market share back to 31% that year in North America. In the other large market, my home of Europe, a place where Sega have always done well, the Dreamcast shifted a ridiculous 400,000 units in just the first month alone and has managed to shift over 500,000 units by Christmas the very next month. This pushed Sega of Europe over six months ahead of schedule in terms of sales forecasts. The impact the Dreamcast was making at launch was absolutely huge. So whilst we are talking about Europe, it is time to once again talk about how I experienced the Dreamcast. If you remember, I left this story off by talking about my 15 year old next door neighbour who had saved up his £2.50 an hour 
by working in the local corner shop on my street in London. Due to this, I was lucky enough to get to experience the system during its launch week in the UK. As stated earlier, in the beginning, I was not that interested in acquiring a Dreamcast, as I'd never bothered going for a Sega system previously, and I felt that owning two current generation games consoles was more than enough at the time. Personally, I was just grateful to be able to try out my friend's system, and more importantly, enjoy seeing him get to experience some of the fruits of his first job. Personally, I was always quite a spoilt child, who was generally bought whatever I wanted by my mother, so it was cool to see my friend receive something so great, who wasn't quite in the same position as myself. Now back to the Dreamcast itself, from my experience playing this system with my friend, I was simply blown away by this little box. Graphically, the imagery I was seeing was like nothing I'd ever seen before, and the system was in a completely different league to my Nintendo 64 and Sony PlayStation. For the first time ever, I was playing games in 3D environments, which featured more than disgustingly ugly, unsightly polygons. It felt like the future had finally arrived. In fact, whilst the games on this system impressed me, it was another glorious feature of this device which started to lead me to envy my friend's console, and that was the system's online capabilities. I had never seen a console used previously for anything but gaming, so the addition of web browsing made this system seem even more desirable and mysterious. The internet at the time still felt like such a mysterious mythical place. In terms of web browsing back then, it was an extremely exciting time. Sure, I had AOL at home on my PC, but I was restricted on how often I could use it, because I was informed by my parents that you paid by the hour to go online back then. Whether or not that is true, or I was just misinformed though, is a different matter altogether. With my friend's Dreamcast, he also had a keyboard, which made the Dreamcast feel even more like it was more than just a normal console. I remember one day signing on online with him and being able to register for a free copy of Choo Choo Rocket. I can remember assuming that this was some sort of scam, as no way was someone going to just send you a game through the post. But sure enough, Choo Choo Rocket arrived a few days later, which I remember us playing online. Finally, and perhaps the most fun part about the Dreamcast was the chat rooms, where we would use the keyboard to randomly try and antagonise people for no reason. We used to find doing this absolutely hilarious, so I guess we discovered the world of trolling way before we were familiar with the term. In fact, did the term trolling even exist in the 90s yet? I suppose this immaturity was kind of just an evolution from our previous tomfoolery, where we would get kicks out of calling random phone numbers to make prank calls. I suppose prank calls were the only real way of trolling back then, without other communication methods. I guess we could have used a carrier pigeon maybe? It is hard to think of an exact timeline of events considering all of this happened nearly 20 years ago now, but I remember one day my mother being given a mobile phone upgrade and passing down to me her old phone. It was either a Nokia 3210 or 8210. Either way, I think I may have had both of these phones at the same time. I remember not particularly caring much for phones, the same as I do not particularly care about them now. When I showed this phone to my neighbour, he freaked out and immediately started offering me loads of his stuff in exchange for this mobile device. I remember almost out of nowhere he offered to trade his Sega Dreamcast for my mobile phone. I was both gobsmacked and excited simultaneously, as I had never even considered that I would have the opportunity to have all three different current generation home consoles at the same time, so I quickly rushed off to find my mother to see if I could strike a trade deal with my neighbour. Upon making this trade request, my mother was not too happy with me. She said since she buys everything for me, it's technically not really mine to be traded away in the first place. She said she had earned it all, not me, so therefore I cannot trade things in which she has purchased. As a child, I was never allowed to sell anything either, which probably assisted me down the line in building the outrageous retro games collection I have. I never earned any of it to sell, I never earned anything to trade. So I suppose my mother was fair in retrospect in placing a huge massive embargo on my trade deal. Either way, this began to make me bitter for a few months. I suddenly really, really, really wanted a Dreamcast after coming frightfully close to owning one myself. I never knew how much I wanted one until I couldn't have it. 
Thankfully though, my mother soon resolved this situation by getting me a Dreamcast of my own for Christmas of that very year. In fact, I also remember getting some N64 games and a DVD player that year for Christmas too. So I really was a spoilt little brat who had no reason to be making trade deals in the first place. Soon I would like to tell you about some of my experiences with the games, but first let's continue to look at the global history of the Sega Dreamcast. So, as you can tell, the Dreamcast launch was a successful, exciting time, which gave Sega somewhat of a renaissance period. The system was so impressive that it even coaxed me into buying a Sega games console for the first time ever. As exciting as the time was, something began to loom in the background. What was coming over the hill? Is it a monster? Despite Sega's best efforts, the PlayStation still held nearly a 60% overall video game market share by the end of 1999. Sony announced their very own next generation games console in the form of the PlayStation 2. In fact, Sony were making outrageous claims about this system, such as it would allow video games which could convey unprecedented emotion. They stated that their graphics processor would feature 1,000 times more bandwidth than even most PC graphic processors. They said the system would even rival most supercomputers and would even be able to render 75 million polygons per second. Further to all of this, they announced that games would feature on a DVD-ROM format of optical disc media, which could hold substantially more data than Sega's pitiful GD-ROMs. Sony even stated that you would be able to use the PS2 to connect to the internet while simultaneously playing games, music and movies. Rumours and hype got so extreme around the PS2 that this supercomputer would feature Toy Story quality graphics. While a Sony executive boasted its online capabilities would give the consumers the ability to jack into the matrix. On top of all of this too, Sony even mentioned that the device would be backwards compatible with the PS1, meaning Sony's massive install base could still play their old library of games on the device. So with all of these promises and sometimes somewhat ridiculous hyperbole surrounding the upcoming PlayStation 2, it makes a hell of a lot more sense why many people would have chosen to ignore the Dreamcast altogether in favour of the PS2. Peter Moore stated that in order for the Dreamcast to be able to compete with Sony, they would need to sell 5 million units in the US by the end of year 2000. But sadly, Sega only managed to shift 3 million. Sega continued its downward spiral of losing money through lowering prices and cash rebates, causing financial losses. Prior to the PS2's launch at the beginning of year 2000's Christmas holiday season, the Sega Dreamcast was even outsold by the PS1 an alternative remodelled version of the five-year-old original PlayStation. People really were dead sot on saving their big bucks for the PS2 instead. I, on the other hand, snapped up a Dreamcast during its life cycle, and what a magical experience I had with the platform. I also got a PlayStation 2 of my own on its first year of release, but after owning a Dreamcast prior, I was somewhat underwhelmed by the whole thing. The early games on the PS2 certainly, graphically, didn't look any better than the stuff I'd played on the Dreamcast previously, and I certainly didn't give a crap about the DVD capabilities either, since I already owned a DVD player in my room. In fact, the following Christmas, after I got a PS2, my mother bought me a DVD recorder as one of my presents for Christmas. There really wasn't anything special about the PS2 at the time, if you already owned a Dreamcast and a DVD player. The rest was just hyperbole really. So with most people simply wanting a PlayStation 2, Sega announced the discontinuation of the Dreamcast and the restructuring of the company as a platform agnostic third party developer. In regards to the discontinuation, Peter Moore had this to say, We had a tremendous 18 months. Dreamcast was on fire. We really thought that we could do it. But then we had a target from Japan that said we had to make X hundred of millions of dollars by the holiday season and shift X million of the units of hardware, otherwise we just couldn't sustain the business. Somehow I got to make that call, not the Japanese. I had to fire a lot of people, it was not a pleasant day. So on January 31st, 2001, we said Sega is leaving hardware. We were selling 50,000 units a day, then 60,000, then 100,000, but it was just not going to be enough to get the critical mass to take on the launch of the PS2. 
It was a big stakes game. Sega had the option of pouring in more money and going bankrupt, and they decided they wanted to live to fight another day. After this announcement, Dreamcast unit prices were slashed to just $99 in the US and eventually even down to $49 after the Dreamcast was discontinued. Commercial games continued to be developed and released for the system, discontinued right up until the end of 2002. After the demise of the Dreamcast, Sega finally returned to becoming a profitable company in 2003, so Sega would continue fine after exiting the hardware market. Now I have kind of covered the Sega Dreamcast's life and death, let's talk about the Dreamcast's game library. After all, games are the defining element of whether or not a console is worth playing in the first place. Let's start with Sonic Adventure, a game I originally experienced in my neighbour's living room all those years ago. Graphically, this game was very impressive and looked amazing at the time. Sega really now taking Sonic himself into a 3D environment and some of the game, like for example the level with the killer whale, looked simply breathtaking. Outside of playing as Sonic though, playing levels with some of the other characters often feel slow, boring and cumbersome. But who the bloody hell likes Big the Cat? I found the game more eye candy than anything else I suppose. The game lacked in-depth gameplay in terms of quality in comparison to what you could get on the Nintendo 64 at the time. At least it looked shiny I suppose. After the demise of the Dreamcast, the game sort of ports to a number of other systems, so there is a variety of ways to try this one out in 2018. Choo Choo Rocket is an action puzzle game. The player guides mice known as Choo Choo's into rockets whilst trying to stop them being eaten by cats. This guiding is done by placing down directional arrows on the field of play. This is a surprisingly fun and addictive little puzzle game, which offers a number of different play modes. Choo Choo Rocket is notable for being the first Dreamcast online multiplayer game. During the time Sega was operating its servers and players were able to play the competitive modes online whilst also being able to upload their own custom puzzles and download those made by other users. Soul Calibur is an example of a Dreamcast version of a game being graphically superior to its arcade counterpart. This was revolutionary at the time and was a unique selling point of the Dreamcast we have yet to touch on during this video. This fantastic fighter served as one of the system's launch titles. This is a fun entry in the series of games, which brought heavy emphasis on weaponry into the fighting genre. Its unique 8-way movement set makes this one of the most memorable Dreamcast games. Another one of the most famous arcade to Dreamcast conversions is of course Crazy Taxi. This game today tops many people's lists of all-time greatest Dreamcast games. This score attack game is fantastic in its pick up and play nature and features many mechanics which are simply lacking for most big releases today. This game received unanimous praise everywhere and went on to become one of the best selling Dreamcast games of all time. I guess core gamers love a game where you get to play as a car. Now I would like to take a minute to talk about this big hitter, Shenmue. Few games have entertained and inspired me quite like this title, and the Christmas morning I received this game is one of my strongest gaming memories. In terms of graphics and immersion, I had never seen anything even close to like this before. It was absolutely years and years before we saw more games as visually stunning as the Shenmue titles. There was just something about this game that feels so much more real than any gaming experience I have ever had, or since. Sure, the voice acting may be cheesy, the controls may be clunky, but this whole game is just a unique, memorable experience. Basically, the game offers everything. It is a revenge story where you must track down the man who murdered your father. However, why do that when you can go to the bar to look for sailors, wander around your hometown asking people if they speak Chinese, or most importantly, mong out in the arcade playing darts, hang on and space harrier all day. If that's not enough for you, you can even get a job and spend every day of your character's life in a forklift truck Groundhog Day hell. Yeah! Shenmue is a truly surreal, fun, ridiculous experience and it was the first game to my knowledge that ever shoved 1980s nostalgia down our throats. Like come on, the game was released in Japan in 1999. However, the story is set in 1986. Think back to how odd that was. It would be like releasing a game in 2018, but setting the story in 2005. An amazingly trippy move from Sega there, but I loved every minute of it, being able to play a game set in the year I was born. Next up, we have WWF Royal Rumble. This was during the Attitude Era. 
back in the day where we used to get an entirely different unique console exclusive WWF game on each system. The Dreamcast offered WWF Royal Rumble, this was definitely the most graphically impressive wrestling game at the time. But the game lacked depth and play modes. One feature that did blow my mind at the time though was that you could have 9 wrestlers fighting in the ring at one time in this one, whereas all previous WWF games limited this to just 4 characters. For fans of massive turn-based JRPGs, the Dreamcast's finest offering is perhaps Skies of Arcadia. Like most games in this video, this was an impressive game for its time. The famous JRPGs of the era such as Final Fantasy 7 through 9 featured pre-rendered backgrounds for exploration, whereas graphically Skies of Arcadia reminded me more of the Ocarina of Time. Certainly a fun JRPG that is worth a playthrough, but be warned there are a lot of long slow turn based encounters. The game doesn't quite match the pace of the likes of Final Fantasy 7, however it did receive an enhanced port of the GameCube which split the amount of random encounters in half. Another iconic game for the platform is Jet Set Radio. This beautifully sail shaded game features a timeless graphical appeal, however the premise of playing as a graffiti tagging inline skating hooligan always kind of rubbed me the wrong way a bit. You see, during the life cycle of the Dreamcast, my part of London was bloody covered in dirty graffiti by all of the local halfwits who lived amongst my community. Yuck. Personally, I have never seen the point of glorifying vandalism, but this is a fun game nonetheless. Next up we have Sonic Adventure 2 because Sonic got to go fast, although in my opinion a superior game to its predecessor, most of the characters once again other than Sonic are nowhere near as fun to play as. It would have been better if all of the levels just featured Sonic. The other fun character to control in this game is Shadow the Hedgehog, however he is perhaps one of the blandest, most boring corporate cash-ins in Sega's history. I mean come on really, does anyone like Shadow? We have pretty much been getting new unwanted Sonic characters ever since this twat arrived, and it appears no one but Chris Chan seems to appreciate them. Oh well, at least these idiots have been dropped from Sonic Mania. To round the game section of this video off, I wanted to talk about the last ever Dreamcast game I received as a Christmas gift. Just like the game's precursor, Shemu 2 blew my absolute socks off once again. This game looked and played just like the first Shenmue game, however this time I was playing in a world that was three times the size. It is truly quite frightening how good this title actually is and I would infer that Ryu's journey from Japan to Hong Kong and China somewhat inspired me to travel around the world in real life. The game is so mentally immersive that it kind of feels like you're exploring a living, breathing world. The ambience of this title is absolutely off the chart, so many great locations to traverse and explore. Out of all of these though, my favourite was probably the walled city of Kowloon. During my first playthrough, I was unaware that Kowloon was once a real place. However, the game presents it in such an interesting way that I've been somewhat obsessed with Kowloon ever since. In fact, when we get these re-releases of the Shenmue games shortly, I intend to release an entire video about Kowloon on this very channel. So make sure you subscribe if you want to see that. Anyway, to finally round off this video, I hope I managed to do a good job of sharing the history and my experiences with the Dreamcast with you. The amount of stuff I've had to say about this thing speaks volumes about what an interesting and iconic platform the Sega Dreamcast really is. The Sega Dreamcast and its library was certainly the most impressive console of its day, and even the mighty PlayStation 2 did not look as impressive in comparison. As you can see, it seems like I have a decent amount of nostalgia for the platform. Although, now in terms of answering the final question of whether or not the Dreamcast is worth playing today, well the answer to that one is debatable. The library of the Sega Dreamcast was fantastic, so the majority of its top games began to get ported to other systems, the very moment Sega announced they were exiting the hardware market. The Dreamcast has tons of great games, but at the same time many of the big hitters can now be experienced elsewhere. I guess we are seeing a similar pattern with the Nintendo Wii U today too, as most of its library is being ported to the Switch. So I guess to summarise, the Dreamcast no longer has a great deal of top level exclusives, however if you want to experience these games how they were meant to be played in their original form, then Dreamcast is the way forward. The graphics overall still hold up very well today, which is unique for the era considering how bad most Nintendo 64 and Playstation 1 games now look. 
So my final thought is if you like a bit of gaming history, make some time for the Dreamcast, you'll probably have some fun. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching the entirety of this video. I really appreciate your dedication to the channel. Before you go, I'd love to hear about some of your very own Sega Dreamcast memories within my comment section. I am sure you all have your own unique stories regarding this system, even those of which ultimately chose not to buy one. Don't forget to like and subscribe for regular content just like this on the channel every single week. If you want to chat with me at some point properly, then you can also join me most Sunday nights live at 9pm BST on twitch.tv slash chat. Come join us for a live stream and we can have all sorts of silly discussions. Yeah. Finally, my channel Top Hat Gaming Man is partly funded from the fantastic support and donations I receive from my lovely patrons. So shout outs to Carl Johnson, Shizuka Kobayashi, Richard Clark, Greg Hooper, Harold Webb, Synth Spaces, Kevin Fahili, David Mountford, Andrew Bazanski, Adnus Garcia, Edward O'Reilly, Pizza Dawn, Retail Archaeology and all of my other patrons. I would really struggle to make these videos about your kindness. If you too would like to support this channel then make sure you check out my Patreon page. Cheerio!